Alright, so <clears throat> this is the dirt road where I actually got the hit on the Fleer. Um, that is Bannister River. It flows along the lower side here. That's actually an old Indian weir that they constructed way back in the day to catch spawning fish as they returned their way back down the river. And on the upper side here, if you can see how steep that is, it's actually a big granite rock face. <coughs> and the clear I got was just a little bit down the road, but the hit was up on that hill. Um, mind you, that night it was about 40 degrees and raining, so I don't feel like it was a person. Um, if it was, they pretty much had to be not wearing clothes because I could see clothes in the clear. Um, still not saying that's what it was, but it was unique and just different. Howdy and welcome to another episode of World Bigfoot Radio, coming to you from Montana and also from the other side of the country, where we have a special first-time guest coming to us. And uh, before we get into the show, I'd like to remind you that the show is viewer-supported. My show is completely demonetized, so I would appreciate it if anybody could throw any help my way at pay paypal.me forward slash World Bigfoot Central. And if you want a t-shirt or a hoodie or a mug, they're also available. There are several designs. Teespring. So without further ado, uh, let us introduce our guest. And this gentleman, you've actually already seen some of his stuff on the show, even though he hasn't been on before. And I reference you back to the show with Michael Patterson, where seven kids got chased out by a Bigfoot in a truck. And this is over in Virginia. Uh, and lo and behold, tonight's guest is also from that same area in Virginia. And we'll get into that in a second. So welcome to the show, Travis Bowen. Uh, yes, sir. Thank you. Glad to have you here, buddy. So let's get that over with in the first place here so that everybody gets up to speed on this. So how did you end up um, being in contact with Michael and getting your uh, your really cool thermal footage to him so we show that on that previous show? Oh, uh, well, <clears throat> me and Michael actually um, basically met through Facebook. Uh, I just one night was kind of searching around some of the different groups and all and um, ran up on a uh, Bigfoot group and I honestly can't remember which one it was we actually met on but I posted a sighting that me and my mother and my oldest daughter had um, which be almost four years ago now and just posted it you know for other people to see what they thought you know get feedback that sort of thing and uh, Michael of course instantly realized where I was talking about and so he uh, PM'd me and we talked back for the next thing we exchanged numbers and we were on the phone for almost two hours that night right. um, we grew up same area um, where he had their awful experiences literally only a few miles from my house and maybe seven or eight miles through the woods where I actually had my encounter so that's that's kind of how we got in touch um, some you very common both- ground yeah, you're both experiencers of the, the White Oak Mountain Monster, apparently. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yep. Apparently so. A um, few years apart, obviously, but uh, 
whole lot of the whole lot of it was uh, spooky similar. Uh, my encounter was nowhere near as aggressive, um, but some of the things he told me about his were very similar to what happened to uh, me and my mom and my daughter. Did you grow up always aware that there was such a thing, or was this like a revelation that came later in life? Uh, no. Um, of course, growing up, you know, I'd watch stuff on TV, and, you know, you'd, every once in a while I'd catch a documentary or something. You know, you'd hear about a site and somewhere on the news, you know, but it was more just like an interest, you know, never really a, like, wow, that they're, they're there, they're here. Um I was uh, about, I think I was 14 years old the first time I really had something spooky happen to me. Um, I got walked out of the woods late one evening, squirrel hunting. Um, where I grew up, it's pretty rural, um, down a dirt road. only two farms on that dirt road. One of them was one I grew up on. Um, big, big block of land by myself, 22 rifle. Um, I was actually up on, it's a, it's a big, tall ridge line above the creek that we all call the bluff. It's, Everybody's always called it that as long as I can remember. And um, I was up there late that evening. It was getting on close to black powder deer season. So I was really doing scouting more than I was squirrel hunting. I just carried 22 because I saw squirrel shoot. And um, I had spotted a few does. It was four or five of them. Um, up the ridge from me, come down the ridge and cross the creek down below me. And this ridge is really steep up there. It's big. Big old growth oak woods, real real steep drop. It's hard to even climb up it, really. And I was watching through the scope of the rifle. It was this little 22 bolt action with a four power scope. And I was just trying to see if there was a buck in the group. And um, the old big lead, though, she was out front. And they were, I'm going to say, a little over 100, maybe 150 yards from me. Um, had a crosswind. No way they'd win me. I was actually down on my knee behind a big falling down oak tree with a rifle laid across it, just watching them. <laughs> oh, you sneaky sniper, you. Good job. Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and that old big doe, she was out front, and I saw her look back up on that bluff where they come from, and I saw her pin her ears, and then her tail went up. And she turned around, actually stomped her front feet a couple times, and then she blew, and they hauled freight. On out, come on out of hearing. I didn't think too much of it, you know. It might have been a dog or a fox or who knows what, you know, does mean they anything. I didn't hear anything up there, so I didn't think much of it. We was getting later on, sun was starting to set. I don't have a light. So I start walking my way out, and it's actually an old sunken road bed up there. This this is actually leftovers from a pre Civil War plantation, actually, the land. And I was walking that old road bed down through the woods. And like I say, these big old growth oaks. You could see most places are decent ways, but it was getting dark. And this early in the fall, still plenty of leaves on the trees, so it was getting dark quick in the woods. And I get to walking, and I start thinking I'm hearing something behind me. And my first thought, and I've, I've had this happen to me before, just out hunting, whatever, as I was hearing my own echo walking. But the more I walked, the more I was beginning to think I won't echo. So I decided to stop real quick, and when I stopped, I heard two heavy steps behind me, and then it stopped. Oh, God. And I stood there for a second. <laughs> I'm 14 years old with a boat action 22 by myself, about a half a mile from the nearest road. And <laughs> Well, you really got to make that one shot count, man. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. Everything, everything I had was relying on that little 36 grain bullet. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> so, so I, I start back walking, and I'm honestly in my mind. I remember it, it was scary. It imprinted on me pretty well. In my mind, I'm trying to tell myself, "They ain't nothing following you." So I stopped real quick again. Same thing. Two steps, and it stopped. And that was when, like, <laughs> it's like you see in the movies, like the the background focuses in behind you. It's like your reality hit. My stomach flipped. I got I got real nerve. First time in my life, honestly, I was ever afraid. And what I'm saying, I, won't, I honestly won't think in Bigfoot at the time. I just really want on my map. I'm just thinking to myself, there's something big following me that's not afraid of me. It's following me. It ain't scared of me. So I picked up the pace. It picked up the pace. It never closed on me. Never made any other sounds. I just knew it was back there. Finally got down to the edge of the pasture. It was a big pasture. And that was, that was my best shot was to get out in the open. It was more light out there, obviously. And I hit the fence. And I mean, when I got within... A few feet of that fence, I broke into a dead run. I caught my hand on the fence post. One foot hit the top wire and over it. I mean, I 
I went. I was proud of myself how good I went over that fence. <laughs> Ran out into the pasture, 40, 50 yards. I spun around with a rifle. Nothing. Walked on home. I still had about a 30 minute walk to get home. Um, but I had to go all the way back down the creek bottom, hit the dirt road, up the dirt road, cross one of our bean fields. I had a good walk, but I, I never heard anything else. And uh, years went by. Um, I told some people about it. It was, just, it was just weird and spooky. Well, I was, I want to say about 19 by this point, uh, me and my younger brother and my cousin, I then told them about it. They didn't believe me. They poked fun at me and this and that and the other. So I challenged them. I said, we'll, we'll go up there and camp out one night. Y'all don't believe me. We'll go up there. So we did. Um, we went during the day, set up camp, good spot on the creek. This is a creek that borders along that big ridge line. And uh, we put up a tent, which we would end up never sleeping in. Uh, oh, God. And had a good, nice, good-sized sandbar at the creek. It's a good-sized creek. I mean, it's got a good flow. And um, that's where we're going to have a fire. Well, we left that afternoon, and um, actually, what the girl I was dating at the time went and met her up in Pinhook, about 40 minutes up the road, but that don't matter. Anyway, that's why we didn't stay up there all afternoon. But by the time we come back, it was nighttime. It was probably 10, 11 o'clock. We're walking in. And we're walking up along that same pasture, and the creek borders the edge of that pasture, and everything on the other side of the creek was woods. So we're walking along, and lo and behold, I start thinking I'm hearing something walking across the creek pacing us. And once again, thinking maybe it's just us here, you know, I'm hearing us walking, but we were walking in grass in the pasture, and I kept thinking I was hearing something in the leaves across that creek. So finally I stopped, and I, I told him, I said, I swear it's something walking on the other side of that creek. And both of them said the same thing. I said, well, well I just thought it was me. I'm like, no, I hear it too. <laughs> so I told him, I said, look, we're going to start by walking. We'll walk a ways. I'm going to do three, two, one, stop. So we walked maybe another 20, 30 yards, and I did three, two, one, stop. We all stopped real quick, and it stopped. Two steps, stop. And them two looked at me, and their eyes got big, and I said, I told y'all. <laughs> they didn't believe me. So we go on. Oh, that we actually about instant karma. You didn't yeah. even have to get into the camp for him to find out you were kidding about your story. Exactly. Yep. Yeah, this this started about halfway there. Oh, jeez. So we get to the camp and we literally spent the majority of the night sitting there listening to this thing circle us. It'd come around up above us on that bluff. We could actually hear across the creek. You'd hear. You could. You could hear the change in the water because this creek, this part of that creek, doesn't have any rocks or any any kind of like rapids or noise. It's really quiet, and you could hear across the creek. It'd come down the other side, real methodical. It wasn't. Been, it didn't make a lot of noise. It wasn't a big hurry. It was just like it'd creep along, across the creek. It'd done this. I mean, just about all night. And um, at one point, now I did have a twelve gauge pump shotgun with me with buckshot this time. I won't take him a 22. <laughs> a little bit better prepared. That's a yeah. good idea. Yeah. yeah. It'll bring a little bit, you know, something a little heavier. But uh, at one point, we had the spotlights. We kept looking, you know. I mean, back then, we didn't have night vision, flea, or none of this stuff, you know. I mean, we this is back in the day. The best thing we had was, you know, like a rechargeable spotlight. Yeah. But we spotted eye shine out in the pasture because we were about 50 yards into the woods up the creek from the edge of that pasture. And me and my brother, took off out there to see what it was because there were no cows in the pasture at this time so we knew it was a cow well we get out there get close to it's a possum he was uh -huh. turned to where we were only seeing one eye so that's, that was eye shine so anyways <laughs> we kind of laughed like it's just a possum well about that time my cousin goes to screaming bloody murder i ain't i've never in my life heard him like that this dude's like a rough tough he's like quarter full blood cherokee tattoos you know just he's one of them guys yeah. Super nice guy, but he, he don't scare you. He's pretty tough. He, I mean, he went to screaming. I thought something got him, honestly. And we go running back. And um, we had the only light with us. <laughs> so all he had was a firelight. And he said that while we were over there doing that, he was standing there peeing in the creek. With the fire. He was standing with the fire. He was between the creek and the fire. It was to his back. He said, whatever this thing was, come charging through the woods up to the other side of the creek bank. And it scared him half to death. And he just went to yelling for us because we had the gun and the light. Yeah. And he said when he went to yelling, it took off running back. Like he scared it. <laughs> so needless to say, we stayed up all night. We didn't sleep a bit. 
I mean, we we weren't going to get in the tent. We weren't going to sleep. We sat around that fire all night with that gun and that light. <laughs> Anyways, fast forward. Um, and I could tell you several other little weird things that happened up there in them woods, different trips. You know, we'd be up there and we'd hear something move around, big, sound like big limbs break, you know, just – but nothing you could ever pinpoint on anything. Just it was just always something spooky. My cousin always called it the boogeyman. <laughs> that, that was our running joke, the boogeyman. You know, there was one night, two years after that, we were going to camp, and I actually went up there by myself to set up camp because one of them had to go see his girlfriend. One of them had to go get beer. One of them had to. It was just everybody had something. To do. I was like, well, I'm going up there. Y'all come on whenever you get yourself straight. So I went up there by myself. Um, I did have an AR-15. Um, three or four extra mags went up on way on up the creek this time where the bend and the bluff actually turns at a 90 degree angle this is where I saw those deer when I was 14 and I set up camp there nothing happened uneventful you know I hadn't heard and I'm just sitting around fire just honestly kind of relaxing enjoying it's quiet real quiet cold nights late fall and the leaves were off trees by then and um they drove in my bu- one of my buddies at the time, he had a big old GMC truck. That thing had like a nine-inch lift, big tires, loud, you know. They come driving in on the farm across the creek. I could see them through the woods there. There was pretty good ways, but I could see the headlight. So I got up from the fire, left my rifle, and I kind of went walking. This is where the creek makes that turn, and it, the bottom of that big hill actually comes almost to the creek. It's just a real narrow little path between the creek, and the creek's like a cutout bank. And I walked around the kind of this kind of like a point where it comes out and i was standing there and i could i could see the truck you know i could actually hear them laughing talking they'd get stuff out the truck carrying on and i heard something up to my right that's up on top of the hill it, it wasn't loud it was just i heard like i heard something step or move just enough to catch my attention and i looked up there and it's steep enough i'm looking up i mean it's probably a good 55 to 60 degree angle and against the sky between two trees, I could see something dark. And it it was enough to me it looked out of place. And I looked, and I watched it for a second, and it turned and took off running. And when it turned to run, the thing that burned into my brain was it wasn't slick like a bear or a deer is. It was shaggy looking. Like, I ain't going to say furry. I'm going to say hairy. Yeah. And in my mind, it was running back towards where my gun was. So I actually took off running back around the fire and grabbed my rod. It's, it kind of, I ain't going to say it scared me too bad because I was just more or less want to get that gun back in my hands. But it took him several minutes to get to me, get across the creek, you know, that sort of thing. I'm just sitting there at the fire with that gun, real quiet. And all I could think to myself, and I have ever since, was whatever that was, and I'm not going to say that's what it was. I'm telling you exactly what I saw. Mm-hmm. Whatever that was had been up on that hill all this time, I think. And I believe when they drove in on the other side, it slipped over there just to check them out. And, you know, I'm sitting there like, well, that, that's great. I've been up here for like two hours by myself <laughs> with oh, some, right. something big and hairy up on his heel. Yeah. Well, you're the only entertainment there, so you had to watch you. Right, right. Well, what so, are your other options? You don't have any giganto-sized uh, bear out over in that area. No. And honestly, back then, bear... To, to even see or hear about a bear was extremely rare. They've, they've gotten pretty common in the last three or four years, but this was, what, around 2000, 2001? Yeah, so there still wasn't so, that many of them in the area. Plus, they don't uh, look like that either. They don't have that kind no, of shaggy no. hair. I, I know what you're describing because I've seen several of them, and it looks like the hair on a freaking musk ox. Exactly, yeah. Yeah, it, it reminds you like a, a cheap wig at the Halloween store. Yeah. <laughs> you know? I mean, exactly. that's exactly just really, really grizzled and matted and just, I, I don't know how to explain it any better than that. Um, and I've seen bears. I mean, I've seen them daytime, nighttime. I hit one with my truck a few years ago. Oh. You know, they're smooth and slick. Yeah. Um, the next thing that happened um, of note would have been four years ago this past fall. Me and it was four or five of us had been. I do a lot of predator hunting at night. We had was get we got a lot of coyotes, um, and they don't have any natural predators here, so I mean, we're the only thing to keep them in check. Yeah, so we had been out 
doing some hunting calling and I was parked down on a dirt road. This is all the same area, same dirt road. This field, the farm where I grew up, my uncle owns it now. My truck was parked down at the creek and we were actually loading up to go home. It's 11, 30, 12 o'clock at night. And um, we were talking, carrying on. I mean, like I said, we were loading up the truck. We weren't being quiet. And first time I've ever heard it in my life, I swear it was a tree knock. My cousin, the one that's always been with me up there, the one who called it the boogeyman, he actually looked at me. He said, was that what I think it was? Because, I mean, of course, we've seen them on TV and videos. Yeah. But I'd never heard one. But it was just the most distinct, like you just took a good piece of wood and smacked the tree way up on that bluff. And this is way up away from where we are. But it was real quiet, clear night. It, it carried down that creek bottom. And me being me, I just, out of curiosity, I did a whoop. And I said, whoop. And that's exactly how I did it, but I did it loud. It echoed just as pretty. Once again, first time in my life I've ever tried to make a call. And it answered back. Whoop. Just exactly like I did it. And that was it. We didn't hear anything else. So I don't believe it was some, first of all, I don't believe it was anybody up there that time of night because it is, it is not easy to get up in there. You have to go on foot. There's no four wheel trails. There's no roads. And it's not an easy walk. You got to hop a couple of creeks, several fences. I mean, it's just not an easy place to get to. If anybody be up there that time of night, and like I said, we'd already been out there coyote hunting. We haven't heard any dogs, anybody coon hunting, nothing. So that was it. We didn't hear anything else. We hung around a little bit, you know, um, loaded up left. Well, that, um, indirectly led to what happened the following spring, which would have been 2016, um, sometime in April. I don't remember the exact date. So by this point, you're pretty well aware that there's freaking Bigfoot out in this world. I, I, was, I was way on that direction because it was just too much yeah, weird. Yeah. yeah, it was just too much going on that I personally was experiencing. Had you, had you looked around to see if there was any more sightings in the local area or anything at that point? Or? I had talked to a few different people starting in high school. And this actually was brought to me. I didn't look for this. This was brought to me. Um, two very good friends of mine I went to school with. I used to hunt some with them and their daddy. Their daddy actually works with my daddy. And one weekend, so I, was at, I don't think I was even driving yet, to be honest with you. I think my daddy brought me up and dropped me off. And they live way up in the middle of nowhere, too. And I spent the night that Friday night because we were going to bow hunt that Saturday morning. And um, they get telling me about this piece of property. We didn't hunt it, but it was just a farm they knew about. And get telling me all these stories about people seeing this big tall thing with eyes glowed red in the light. And it would follow people and whistle at them and, you know, just crazy stuff. And, um, of course, you know, it's all a good story night before you go in the woods in the dark. And I... <laughs> So yeah. later on, when I was in high school, I worked at the local vet veterinarian's office. And I was in there just one day in the office, two of the girls that worked in there, you know, telling about what they didn't told me. Because it was just creepy, you know. I'm more or less telling it just mess with them. And um, lady, I think her name was Robin. It's been so long, I'm not positive. She was right much older than me back then. She sat back in her chair and put her hands over her mouth. And her eyes got big. And I'm like, what? Well, come to find out, her mama owns a land that butts up to the back side of this man's property from a different road access. But her mama had told him years ago that she'd seen a big, tall, gray, wild man covered in, fully covered in gray hair, no clothes, standing out at the edge of the woods behind the house. Oh, God. Said walk, they color and everything. Yeah. Walked on two legs, you know. And eight years later, her older sister saw the same thing standing in the same spot and watched him walk into the woods. Well, that, that actually got me extremely interested in Like, well, they weren't just messing with me. They, these are two different groups of people that do not know each other that are kind of telling me the same thing in the same area in the same time frame. Mm -hmm. So then I was at work one night years ago, just night nice shift telling stories. You know, I got to tell one of the guys about all this stuff. He done the same thing. He sat back in his chair and he got the like, freaked out look on his face. He said, where was this at? And I told him, he said, Oh, hell no, man. And he, it's like he got visibly kind of nervous. Like it bothered him. I'm like, what? Well, he gets to telling me when he was a kid that they would always go to his grandma's house on Christmas Eve. Everybody, all the family get together, eat, you know, that sort of thing. 
Well, this particular Christmas Eve, and this would have been back in the 80s, um, honestly, right around Michael's incident. Oh, God. His, is this going to be a Christmas Yeti story? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's kind of sounding like one, ain't it? Yes. <laughs> so he, he said his aunt showed up. She was by herself. She showed up and said she come in the house trembling, white as a sheet, couldn't even talk. Like I mean, on the verge of like a panic attack. And no, nobody knew what, what was wrong with him. They trying to calm her down. You know, they talking about calling, you know, rescue squad. They finally get her calm down enough to talk. She said right before she got to the driveway, she said a tall, gray, hairy monster run across the road in front of her car on two legs, and she almost hit it with a car. Oh, God. And then she's got to stop and turn in the driveway right after that. Right. I would have yep. kept going. I'm sorry. I would have I would have called you from a hotel and said, you know, I was going to stop. But here's what happened. <laughs> yep. So, yeah, I mean, to answer the question, if you talk to people one on one, most people ain't going to come out. They see something like that and just tell everybody. Because people, you know, they do like you're crazy. You know, what are you smoking? You on drugs? You know. Yeah. And I've talked to enough people locally. I mean, yeah, it's it's actually a whole lot more activity over the years than what I would have, I mean, honestly, ever thought about. Because growing up, what I did see about, you know, Bigfoot, whatever, it was either in the Himalayas or the Pacific Northwest. Northwest, yeah. And, that know, was it. Over there. I had the same yeah. thing where I grew up, northern Minnesota. Nobody up there had any idea that there could actually be Bigfoot up there, even though there had already been the Minnesota Iceman. Which right. everybody immediately passed off as some kind of hoax. That ain't real. There's no Bigfoot in Minnesota. Oh, the hell there ain't. I saw it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Well, I'm trying to keep this on a timeline. <laughs> my You're, next, okay. You're okay. My next strange thing um, in my house where I live now is on the side of White Oak Mountain. Um, I'm on the northwest side. And the girl I was dating at the time she was over here. It was it was November. It was cold, one of them cold, clear nights. And I had Great Danes, matter of fact, at the time, outdoors. And they balked everything. But that night, me and her, we didn't get an argument about something. I don't remember what. But she had walked out. Um, I don't, honestly, I don't know if she, she's probably getting ready to leave, but either way, she walked out. And then, just a minute, she walked right back in the door. And she said, Come out here and tell me what this is. And of course, I'm still kind of swole up about all. I'm like, what? You know? And she said, I heard something. Come out and tell me what it is. I'm thinking probably, you know, bobcat, screech owl. You know, she's heard something. Coyotes, whatever. Well, I step out on the call point, and I'm, I'm like, what? You know, I don't hear anything. It's quiet. There's no dogs barking, nothing. It's just quiet, real quiet night. And all of a sudden, I hear the most god awful thundering, yelling, roar. I, I don't even know how to, to tell you, I don't know what to call it. Right up on the mountain behind the house. I mean, it couldn't have been a half a mile, if that. And I mean, it was intense. The duration of it, the power of it, the volume of it. I mean, I could almost feel it. And I got chills. And the reason I got chills is the only place I'd ever heard anything like that was, I think if you go to the BFRO's website, it's on... I think it's the Ohio. The Ohio Hall. Yeah. I, yeah, I think that's it. And that was that was the only reason I could even tell you what it was because I, I I didn't believe it was no man. I mean, I've never met anybody that could carry. I mean, as long the the duration and volume of it, you wouldn't have enough air in your lungs to do it. It was yeah. unbelievable. But it's the real deal. The volume so loud. It's either you know like somebody with a massive PA system or a big foot. Yeah, that's that's it. I mean. But it, get, it got better than that because I looked at her. My eyes got big and I got chills. I said, you, she, she, looked, she said, what is that? I said, you ain't going to believe me if I tell you. And I went to say, she said, wait a minute, wait a minute, it's another one. And sure enough, way off, it's, it's actually a pretty good sized highway a couple miles from me. This dude, he had to be beyond that, yelled back. And they yelled back and forth five or six times. And then everything got quiet. Never heard, I've never heard it since. But... I know the whole time that there are dogs all up and down my road. I got a buddy named Ren's got coon hounds. I had Great Danes. I had another neighbor back here. I don't know what he's got, but they sound awful when they bark. There was not a dog on this road making a sound. Yeah. It's like the world went quiet. 
<laughs> but <laughs> really that was, quiet. Yeah. Even the bugs aren't making any noise. Yeah. Yeah. It was. It was like for that that brief period of time, it's like you know, they just owned the, the night, you know, and that really got me into it. So to oh. get up. What did your that, girlfriend think of this? She, she, you know, to this day, she, I mean, I ended up marrying her, actually. She's now my ex-wife, but to this day, she's still a skeptic. Really? Even after hearing that, she's like, oh, that, it ain't no way. I'm like, what do you think it was? She said, I don't know. Bigfoot ain't real. I'm like, okie dokie. I mean, you, know, you heard that. I mean, so we, um, now she did go with me. Um, since... We heard the other one way off on the other side of the mountain. That's where her daddy's farm is. He's got three hundred, about a three hundred acre farm over there. So this would be the first time I actually went out Bigfoot researching. So I had a Primos Alpha dog predator call, which is a very loud call. I took an iPod because I could hook it to it, and I actually went to the bathroom and shut the doors. That was the best acoustics I could get. I did my best to mock that sound. Recorded on that iPod, and me and her and my brother and the girl he was dating at the time, we went over there behind her parents' house, way off down in the woods, set out to call. There's a four-wheeler trail, great four-wheeler trail goes back in there. I mean, it's just like, it's like a kitchen floor. It's hard, packed, quiet. So we go back in, we put the call out, and I throw that dude on. I sound like crap doing it, but, it, you know, best I could do. Uh -huh. And part the way through it, we're all just sitting there, no lights, quiet, you know. I heard a low, deep sound behind me, and I actually thought my brother said something real low. He's got a deep voice. I thought he just said something low, and I turned around, and I was like, do what? And he, I could see his eyes. It was enough moonlight. He said, that won't me. And I'm like, what well, do you mean it won't you? And he just took his thumb and, like, pointed over his right shoulder behind him. Whoa. Now, we didn't hear anything else. Later on, what he told me, he heard sounded like just a deep... <clears throat> grunt he said it was deeper and more guttural than what he could do but it just sounded like a deep grunt so anyways we hang around you know hang around a while we don't hear anything else we get up to leave now by this point i did have night vision i had a really basic bushdale gen one handheld but it, still it worked so we're on our way out we got within i'm gonna say about 75 yards of the field where my truck was parked and I handed him the keys. I said, y'all go into the truck. I'm going to hold back a bit just for curiosity. So I stepped behind a tree there, and I was just standing there real quiet. I, I was curious to see if something would, would follow us. I've been following before. I was like, well, I'm going to see if I can't trick this joke. Yeah. And sure enough, I was about positive I could hear something coming down that trail. So I eased around the tree, and I had to, I did have the infrared illuminator on at night vision because it really, it was very basic, primitive. It didn't really work good without the hour illuminator on. And about the time I eased around that tree, I caught a pair of eyes, quick eye shine, that just in my mind were too far apart, too big around, and too high off the ground to make sense. And it was like a side step behind a group of trees real quick. So I moseyed right on out to the truck, and we left. <laughs> oh, <Whoa>, yeah. <laughs> you know, and... But it was enough to make me go on and go to the truck. I don't want to see any more standing there by myself. Um, but that, that all of this ultimately led up to finally having what me and my mom and my daughter saw. That, that, that was, for me, that was it. I mean, there's no more doubt. Um, well, before we go on to that, let's make a quick note for people, all, all joking aside here. When you see the eye, the eyes like that, what Travis is pointing out is really valid, and that's one of the ways that you can tell that you're not looking at some other animal's eye shine. The eyes are big. They're too far apart, and they're facing forward. They have binocular vision. They're not on the sides of their heads like big prey animals. So it's fairly obvious what you're looking at. The only other can, thing it could be is something like an owl, and they don't hover in midair eight or nine feet up. Well, even with this, I mean, I can add to that. I'll, I've done so much night hunting, predator hunting, um, with some pretty cool equipment at that. And owls frequently come into those calls. What I saw that night was farther apart and bigger than an owl's eyes. Yeah. So that, that's what rattled me like it did. Um, and I mean, Lord knows the coyotes, bobcats I've seen, foxes, you know, deer, you name it. 
That no, one I almost uh, walked into in the dark uh, at, at my house with Ken. I, I at first mistook his eyes for sunglasses. You know what the sunglasses looked like in the seventies? Those big fat lenses with the curved yeah. bottoms on it. That's what his eyes looked like, and they were the same size. And the reason I recognized that it wasn't actually sunglasses after I got too close is that they were too far apart. Yeah, yeah, that that was the same. To me, it looked like about the size of golf balls, about ten inches apart. Yeah, I've never seen anything else a direct eye shine that had eyes that big and that far apart. My, I mean, even a cow. I mean, I've seen cows in the night vision and in the infrared. I mean, they were falling apart in cows' eyes. Yeah. So, and it was different too because cows' eyes are more on the side of the head; they're not forward facing. It, so their eye shine is it, just—it was like, pow! You know, it was like intensely there. And that's um, one thing you can always tell the animals apart from <laughs> because the uh, predators have binocular vision facing forward, and the prey animals kind of have their eyes a little bit more to the side so they can keep an eye on all around them because they're looking out for things that are going to kill them. Right. Uh, predators need the binocular vision so they can judge distance and direction and uh, you know hone in on their prey. So, yeah, you know, and, you know, humans and wolves, Bears, well, bears are kind of omnivores, but for the most part, predators, their their eyes are forward facing. Yeah, yeah. So, to lead up to, um, I guess what I'd say was a coup de grace for me. And this this took everything from a this is a whole lot of weird stuff adding up to. There's no, I mean, I'll tell you right. I don't care what anybody says. Yes, they're real. They're there. They're super freaking smart, extremely stealthy. And they're big, big. So that evening, me and my mom and daughter, they wanted to go do something creepy fun. Well, down there on that land, this is all the same area um, where I grew up. Across the dirt road from my farm and on down the road a ways, you go down in there, it's a, it's a farm road, goes down, there's a couple old tobacco book barns, and actually some old tobacco stick barns from where they used to fire flew them back in the day. Open fields, you go across the field, right inside the edge of the woods there, so it's a stand of oak woods. It's probably about the size of an average house. And then it goes into thicker, like planted pines. And you walk through them, but they, you can't see very far into them either. They're about 30 feet tall, but they're fairly dense. Well, there's an old slave cemetery, a pre Civil War slave cemetery that was a part of that plantation. And it's really old. It's just little sunken graves with just literally just rocks stuck in the ground. There's no, it's not like a headstone, it's just a rock. There's no, nothing on them. Well, they want to go down there. You just, you know, cause it's spooky and fun. And we, we went down in the daytime. Um, I parked my truck in the driveway of the farm there, my uncle's farm where I grew up. And we walked. And it's a pretty good walk. We get down in there, you know, and my daughter was actually videoing the whole time. It's an old high film Sony. It's actually a good camera. Um, she was just for fun. She was 14 at the time, just for fun. She was video and everything, you know, and, um, I had taken my AR-15 that I predator hunt with. And the reason being is it had an ATN X-Site 1, which is a fully digital infrared illuminated night scope. It's a day or night scope, but for the night purposes, it's infrared illuminated. So I brought that. Nice. Now at the time I did not have my FLIR. I would probably give a toe or a finger to have had my FLIR that night, but I didn't have it at the time. And I, that night is actually what pushed me to buy it. I mean, I actually saved up, worked overtime, sold a gun just to buy it because of what happened that night. Um, getting on about dark, it was, it was my mom's idea. I wasn't even thinking about Bigfoot or anything like that. She knew about the tree knocking the whoop the fall before, a few months before that. We saw the same area right there. So it j as it was getting dark, she, she told me, she said, will not you do some tree knock or do a tree knock? So I looked around, found a pretty good stick, walked over to a tree. I did four or five knocks, hear nothing. Did four or five more. Way down in the bottom across the creek up in there where I had my very first got followed with a deer in the 22, one single knock. And that was like, whoa, wait, <laughs> you know. So I did like three or four more. And was immediately responded with three knocks right over the hill, maybe a oh. hundred yards away. I mean, like loud enough, I jumped. Uh oh. 
And I turned around and looked at my mom and my daughter, you know, and I dropped a stick. And I went right, my gun was propped against the tree. I went over and picked my rifle up and fired the scope up instantly because I got a little freaked out. Mainly because I had my daughter and my mama with me. You know, yeah. all, my, all my protective instincts are kicking in, you know. So there I am with my mama, my 14 year old daughter, middle of nowhere, and something just picked a stick up and hit a tree with it. <laughs> you got to have hands to do that. Yeah. And I got my scope fired up, got comfortable. I did. I had a sidearm. I did. I had a 45 ACP 1911 on my belt. And in doing wrong, I'm not trigger happy. I had no intentions in my mind. Of, I, I still to this day don't, would never even think about wanting to shoot one unless it came down to, I had to. Yeah, self defense. Yeah, I don't want anybody to think I'm that kind of guy because I'm not. Um, and I, I would, I would, I don't believe in killing one to prove its existence because I don't think that that don't matter. I know they're real. Anybody's ever experienced knows they're real. That to me is just why are you going, why are you going to kill something that rare and that special just to prove to non believe I mean, I just don't believe in that. But any, anyways, so um, got to you know these knocks right over the hill. I mean, it was close. And that right there told me, reminded me of that night when I went up there in camp. I set up a camp by myself. That dude was there already, listening, watching, whatever. So I, I did a whoop. Now, he didn't whoop. I, I'm going to say he, the only reason I'm going to say he was because how big it was. Um, didn't whoop back, he grunted. And that, that was a thing talking to Michael that night, that deep, guttural grunt. It almost sounded like a, a gorilla that was way too big and too deep. I mean, that's the only thing I know to compare it to. It was a deep, just... <clears throat> mm -hmm. And it started coming to us. You could hear him coming. It wasn't wasn't oh it wasn't loud, it wasn't noticeable. If we'd have still been talking, that dude could have walked all around us. We never would have paid attention to it. So we all got real keen and real focused. And I'm looking for that IR scope. Um, and anybody's interested in just for the fun of it, you can go on YouTube and look up ATNX Site One and see the videos, the resolution they give. They're great, great scopes for the money. I am looking, 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 looking. I can, I, I can hear the thing moving and cannot see it. Just kept on trying just to catch an eye shine movement, something. And um, it got closer, and my daughter didn't hear the first grunt. My mama did. My daughter didn't. Like I say, she's got the camera going the whole time. Um, didn't actually catch it on camera. Did catch eye shine right towards the end, but I'll get to that. But that dude grunted a second time, and he was a lot closer when he grunted that time. And you can actually see the camera shake. And she whispers, she says, Daddy, I don't want to do this anymore. <laughs> she didn't get scared. And I didn't want to move. I mean, in my mind, I'm, I'm in a good spot. I'm defensive. You know, I just don't want to move. We'll let this play out. You know, this thing will make a decision what it wants to do. And this goes on for, I mean, it's all happened quick. I mean, like he got there quick. I paid attention. He stayed downwind. He circled down around to my right. And there for a little bit, everything got quiet and I didn't know where he was. And all of a sudden I heard just the slightest little crush of a leaf. And I didn't have enough at that point. This rifle, I had that scope on it, but I also had it set up on the left side of the front forearm. I have a very, I think it's a 900 lumen white LED tack light with laser. I threw that tack light on. And for whatever reason, my, my habit is to sweep left to right. I just tend to do that. And I wished I'd have started on the right. I swept left to right. And I hit him right at the end of my sweep. He was about 20 yards away, standing between two cedar trees. He had come around and got in the field and snuck up the edge of the woods where he'd be quiet, not in the leaves. And when he, I guess when he stepped between them two cedar trees, he stepped on a leaf or enough leaves to make that sound. And when I hit him with the light, I'm going to say all I saw was a shoulder, hip, and leg. As he he'd already was turned into his run. He knew the light was coming. He was turning. I did it quick, but I wasn't quick enough. And what I saw was a light, dirty blonde. I'd almost compare it to a golden retriever in color. Really matted, nasty, like, I mean, oh, just kinky, curly. I mean, his whole back just looked like a shag carpet or something. I mean, it was just, it wasn't slick and pretty, like, like I said, like a deer or a bear. He was fully upright. His back, I got a double door stainless refrigerator. His back was wide on that refrigerator. You couldn't fit him through the doorway of a house. And I knew he was tall. Just it, it looked tall, felt tall. And the reason I can tell you how tall he was, we went back two days later in the daytime. 
that's when I found the footprints. I actually got a picture of one of those pretty good. Well, and I went and stood in the same spot and put my hand over my head. And I've measured me with my boots on. My, my fingertips were seven foot two with my arm extended. And my daughter and my mom were both looking at me and said, no, it was taller than that. Now, after we saw it, he ran out into the field. The field was grown up with weeds about chest deep. He walked through it, no problem. It wasn't real thick, but you couldn't see anything. We had to go across that field to get back. So I walked out to the, I was ready to go at this point. I mean, I didn't seen this. I'm like, all right, this is time to go. We need to go. And I told him, I said, y'all stay right behind me. I put Taylor, my daughter, right between us. I said, y'all stay close. We're going to move slow. If I stop, y'all stop. If I say get down, y'all get down. Eased out. I scanned the field with that white light real good. Didn't see anything. Because when he ran, he didn't go far. I heard him stop. He just got out of light. Did he go into the woods or toward the field? No, he ran out into the field. I assume what he did was ran out there and just got down because those weeds were so tall. Yeah, and then he could just spider crawl out of there. Did you get a look yeah. at his face at all when you had the light on him? No, he he had already turned. turned. Way too fast, he yeah. was he was about three quarter away when the light actually hit him. So, like I say, I just saw the shoulder. I, I mainly saw his right side, shoulder, arm, which is arm. I saw the elbow, like his arm was tucked into the room. But I saw, like, basically, like, the right buttock and leg really good. Mm -hmm. that, that's, what's, that's just what's, like, burned into my brain was that one split second of image. Um, but he did. He, him or another one paced us out because we had to go across that field, which wasn't too far to get across the field, and we got back on that farm road, which is a really good gravel road. But walking up that, you're enclosed in the woods, and we kept thinking we were hearing something behind us to our right. We get on up to that. We didn't walk the dirt road back to my truck. We actually got in the pasture. I wanted to be in the pasture because first of all, it's more open. And second of all, it's quiet. That yeah. pasture was really grazed down really good, just like mowed grass. And about halfway across that pasture, I just I knew we was hearing something to the right. There's a hedgerow that splits that from another pasture. It's probably 150, 200 yards across there. I cut that, I fired my scope back up, cut my hour light back on, and scanned that tree line. He grunted at us again. He, he didn't like that hour light. Huh. So we went on, got to the truck, fired up, we left. And at the moment, all of it, you don't process it. It's like as time goes the next day or two, it's like you just can't quit thinking about it. And you're just adding up all the little details. Like that, that really just happened. <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, and I'll tell you this, my mama, up until then, I mean, she grew up up in Bedford County, up in the foothills of the Blue Ridge, ripped and run through the creeks and hollows, farmed. To this day, my mama will not step in the woods without a pistol on her. And she's never done that until that incident that night. Wow. So it, it, it she'll, she will go in the woods. She'll go out there with me. But um, she carries a gun. She, ne she ne never carried a gun until then. Yeah, I can see why that would have rattled her a little bit, you know. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Even hearing the stories and stuff is one thing, but then when you actually see one for yourself, it's completely different. Then when you hear a story, it sounds a lot different than when you were hearing them thinking it wasn't real. Well, that's the thing. I mean, and it hadn't stopped me from what I do. I mean, I still go out and hunt. I go out there by myself. Because, I mean, it's not doing me wrong. I'm, I pay attention to everything. Yeah. Um, move slower and quieter than I ever used to. Just I'm, I'm more way more aware, but it's like I always I tell anybody well, if they wanted to get me, they'd have been and got me. Yeah, I mean, all the years I've spent as a kid, I ripped and ran all through them bottoms and heels and fall. I mean, you know, they never bothered me. So, yeah, I've been paced by them before too. The last time was just uh, December before last. We were up the ghost town of Coloma and got stuck. And I had to try and be the one to walk out and get help. And so I'm walking down the mountain by myself on this road that's usually closed off that time of year. So there's no traffic on it. <laughs> and I get to the first house down the hill, and there's not even any ruts going in the driveway on that one. So nobody's even been there. And I'm like, okay, well, I guess I'm walking like another five miles. But right about then, it's starting to get dark, and I can hear something up on my uh, left pacing me on the high ground off to my left-hand side. And I did just what you're talking about, stopped a couple times to see if there was any more steps, you know, yeah. and, and there yeah. was both times. Yeah. And I'm walking along, it's getting dark, I don't have a gun, I don't have a flashlight, I'm walking with a cane, 
And I started thinking to myself, well, you know what? It ain't a grizzly because it's winter. They're sleeping. And <laughs> it, it could be worse. It could be a mountain lion. As long as a Bigfoot's following me, I know there's no mountain lions following me. <laughs> right. <laughs> After about 15 minutes later, some snowmobilers came down the hill, and I hitched a ride with them and got out of there. <laughs> But, yeah, I wasn't too worried in that situation because we camped up there a few times, and the, the squatch that live up there seemed like they're fairly indifferent and just curious about humans. So he had probably yeah. already seen me before and was going, what the hell is he doing walking down this road in the middle? Of, you know, it's dark. He doesn't have a flashlight or a gun. He's by himself. What the hell is he doing? <laughs> well, I've actually wondered some, that particular area down there, it seems like the – the stuff has escalated over the years to finally actually having like a sighting. Um, I actually left out one, one little trip we did one night. We were in a tent pouring down rain, like four in the morning, something big and heavy come walking real slow down the Creek bottom, walked up behind the tent and like poked on the back of the tent three or four times and went walking on down the Creek bottom. Um, that's actually the last time I've ever slept in a tent and I will not sleep in a tent. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> because of that. But, you know, I, I've, I've actually often wondered, I mean, growing up down there, as much time as I spent in those woods, hunting, camping, you know, we go out, it's old houses out in those woods. We go out there and look for like antiques and bottles, drink bottles, you know. I've spent a lot of time in those woods. This is a big area of land. And I can't help but wonder if it ain't just the same group that either comes through there. It's typically dead of winter and summer. There really wasn't much activity. Most stuff was always spring or fall. So I, I feel like maybe they move around. Maybe that's just one of their favorite spots, spring or fall. I don't, I don't. That's just a little theory of mine, based on what I've seen. Um, but I just can't help wonder if they, they know me. Like they're familiar with me being in those woods, and I've, I've never been a threat in any kind of way, you know. I get the impression that's kind of how they operate. After they've seen you enough times, and and you're never acting threatening. Like in my case, I, you know, the places I go and research these guys, I don't even carry a gun. Never go right. hunting there or anything. So I'm completely harmless and, you know, just not an issue, basically, as far as they're concerned. There's no, there's no way he can hurt us, so we can go get nice and close to them and watch if they're up. And that's what you want to encourage them to do if you're interested in doing research on them. So anyway, yeah, that, uh, oh, man, I mean, all that kind of stuff. Having them that close to where you live, too, I, I understand what that's like because I had them come right up on the freaking yard where I grew up, you know. Well, I wonder if they didn't do that down there. We went through a spell when I was a teenager. Somebody or something would knock on our door at night, and there was never anybody there. But like I say, it's the middle of nowhere. There were no neighbors. Yeah, you haven't got Is neighbor it? kids from a half a mile away that are trying to prank you or something. Yeah, yeah. So. Yeah, no, it was similar with us. We had, I think, our nearest neighbor was about a half mile away, but um, mostly the neighbors did get along with each other, and we had bears raiding the, around the yards and stuff. So. If you went on somebody's yard in the dark, you're probably going to get shot with a shotgun. You know, don't yeah. do that. Yep. Yeah, it's kind of the same thing down there. That just ain't something you do at night. <laughs> yeah, you know, and well, what else could it be? If it isn't humans doing it, you got something coming up and whapping on your house or knocking on your door. Yeah, yeah. Kind of leaves well, you, short list. To add to that, we always had rabbit beavers growing up. I mean, I always had at least six, between six to ten. And uh, we left about in the summertime. You know, we lived so far out. They they went rabbit hunting on their own every morning, you know. But at night, they were always around the house. Mm -hmm. Anybody pulled down that driveway, it was a long driveway, like it's about a half-mile driveway off of the dirt road. I mean, they'd go crazy, you know, dogs barking, carrying on. But every night that that ever happened, somebody or whatever knocked on the door, the dogs never made a peep. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So that, that just made it even more strange, you know what I mean? Yeah, that sounds like Bigfoot to me because I've had I've heard that from other people where caveman too, you know, they'll come around his property and the dogs will be hiding underneath the truck. Right. Yep. <laughs> they ain't barking, they're hiding, you know. Yeah. So wow. Uh...